going back to the beginning of the course, I had divided WebRTC up into two logical parts. Number one here was the media portion. So we used Get User Media or Get Display Media, and then we interacted with it, right, with constraints and manipulated it, whatever. That's part one. We want to be able to get the media so that part two, we can actually send it to someone else using a connection. And all of that magic happens with our TC peer connection. Section one was about the media. Section two is going to be about the connection. The magic of WebRTC, at least in regards to the connection, I've mentioned this before, but is that we can create a connection that is peer-to-peer, -peer, which means two computers, two browsers can be connected directly to each other, and they can pass data back and forth without the need for a middleman. Historically, what you would have done, or at least what I would have done, is I would have set up a WebSocket server, and the, the computer on the left would send the data through. The WebSocket server would just pass it right on through, and vice versa. Okay, with WebRTC, we don't have to do this bottom part because we can connect the browsers directly to one another. It is awesome for lots of reasons, to name a few. It will eliminate the opportunity for bugs, for security holes. It will lower latency, etc. Okay, so we don't need a middleman, except we do. <laughs> uh, this was the really confusing part to me when I was learning WebRTC, as I couldn't figure out, okay, do we, do we need a, a WebSocket server? Because I keep hearing, hearing, us talk, hearing people talk about them. I keep hearing about the, the signal server. I mean, what's going on? Do we need one or not? Well, the answer is you need one to get connected, and then it's not necessary anymore. There are two problems for the browsers connecting uh, up front without help. One is they need to be able to find each other, and two browsers cannot, just simply cannot, find each other on the internet without help. Okay, so that's part one. Part two is they need to exchange some information in order to be able to connect and in order for that uh, connection to be useful. That's namely going to be the codec, but th there's, a, there's some other data that goes in there. These two things, the browsers need to know before they can connect, which means someone else needs to do the, the connecting. Someone else needs to pass those through. Okay, And this process is known as signaling. Okay, You can use anything you want for signaling. So I pulled up the, the docs here. This is a great, a great article on signal and video calling. But it says here that a connection is established through a discovery and negotiation process called signaling. Once the signaling is done, the browsers won't need any more help unless for some reason you wanted to negotiate. In this article, they mention that you can do it any way that you want. There is nothing in the specification that says it has to be done with WebSockets or HTTP. It says that you could use a, a, a carrier pigeon if you wanted to. If you don't know what a carrier pigeon is, back in the Middle Ages, you'd tie a little note to a bird's ankle or, or foot, and it would fly home and <laughs> take the message to somebody. And that's a ridiculous example. I'm sure no one has ever done that. But these two things over here on the left, number one and two right here, these are, are just going to be little pieces of JSON, right? The find is going to be what's called an ice candidate. We'll talk about that more later. And the second one is going to be a little, uh, a little object, which is called an SDP. You have to get those two things, this object and this object, will need to go from this browser to the other browser. And the docs are telling us that we can, do, we can accomplish that any way we want. We can print it out to the DOM or to the console, and the user could copy it and paste it in a tweet or an email. And somebody else out on the internet could see that tweet or email and copy it and paste it into their browser, get theirs, paste it back. The, the original user would do exactly the same thing, paste it into their browser, and voila, you're connected. Um, I guess you could, you could print it out, put it on the, the ankle of a pigeon, and send it home. And the person at home would get the message, and they would type out each character one at a time. They would print out theirs, attach it to the pigeon, send it back to you, and you would do the same thing, and then you would be connected. It doesn't make any difference. The point is simply that this information needs to get onto both browsers and the browsers can't do it themselves. Something else needs to do it. Once it's been done, once it's on both sides, the signaling part is finished, unless you want to renegotiate. This process is typically going to be done the normal web way where we will use a server. And so my server is a little bit small because I'm kind of running out of room here, but we will send to the server our SDP, which again, don't worry about what that stands for, what it is, we'll talk about it later, 
and we need an IP address that that is reachable, we'll send that to the WebSocket server, it will send it to the other client, and then the client will do exactly the same thing back over. That, right, that process makes that server a signaling server. We are going to use Socket.io for our signaling server. It doesn't make sense to use HTTP, though you could. You'd have to do it with long polling or something like that because the client needs to send up through the WebSocket server its data. That's easy with HTTP, right? That's just an HTTP request. But then the server needs to, to send it out to the other client without a request coming in. And that is very awkward with HTTP. There's not an easy or obvious way to do that. This is precisely what WebSockets are for. You're always connected so you can push something out whenever you've got it. The same thing will happen in reverse where this client, as soon as it has its SDP and its ICE candidates ready, will need to pass them back the other way and the server will need to push it out. So we're going to use Socket.io. You can use naked WebSockets if that's absolutely what you want to do. I happen to be a Socket.io guy. I will pretty much always use that as opposed to naked WebSockets. Socket.io is built on top of WebSockets. It just comes with some features that I always use and don't want to implement myself. If you want to hear my full my full pitch on, on why you should use Socket.io, I have a Socket.io course. One of the free previews is, is my pitch on why you would choose Socket.io over, over naked WebSockets. But if you, you absolutely want to use WebSockets, that's fine. It will be almost a one-for-one -one swap because you're accomplishing exactly the same thing. We are going to unpack these two, the find and the exchange info, over the next couple videos. But it's important up front that you know that the signaling process is the beginning before the browsers can connect with each other. They need someone to help them find each other and they need someone to exchange information. Once that has happened, we don't need the signaling server anymore and they're able to talk directly to each other. We will remain connected to our Socket.io server because we'll use it for lots of other stuff that WebRTC is not good at. But that is the whole process of that RTC peer connection, getting that direct peer-to-peer -peer connection set up, and using WebRTC to its fullest.